Welcome, and thank you, Brenda, for a really wonderful talk. That was uh, inspiring. I'm delighted to introduce this panel. My name is Barbara Beer. I'm a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and the Brigham and Women's Hospital and a hematologist there, and the faculty director of the Multi-Regional Clinical Trial Center at the Brigham and Harvard. I'm delighted to introduce this panel today, and I think instead of my introducing each of the wonderful speakers we have, I'm going to let you introduce yourselves. Let me start with Lachelle. Well, first and foremost, thank you for having me for this uh, discussion. It's a topic I'm, I'm pretty passionate about. Um, my name is Lachelle Robinson. I am the Director of Diversity and Inclusion at Takeda Pharmaceutical. Um, and essentially, my, my day to day role is really making sure that our trials that we're executing uh, reflect the diversity of the patients. Thank you. Thank you. And Javon? Barbara, many thanks. Uh, thanks for having me here today. Uh, Barbara, I am a physician working in the pharmaceutical industry. I'm based at Pfizer in Connecticut. I'm currently leading a group of clinicians who work to drive rare diseases, um, execute upon rare disease clinical trials. Previously, I've worked in several therapeutic areas, and my experience has been as an investigator, as a treating physician, as a as a trialist designing the trials across several therapeutic areas. I've previously been based in Europe and have moved over to the US in 2007. I'm looking forward to the discussion, Barbara. Thank you, thank you so much. So, you know, industry and academic medicine and community health centers, and I think the entire public have really um, alerted to the importance of diversity inclusion in clinical trials and in health and in addressing issues of health equity more generally. Um, and I think as you do, that it's very important that we work together to address uh, the challenge and really begin to think through what we can do to make this better and to change that. So let me start with Lachelle and ask you sort of what are the, the big initiatives that you are undertaking and then I'm going to ask Javon, just so you can think about it, in the rare disease space, what additional issues come up? So, Lachelle. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a, it's a good question. Um, specifically to what we're, we're doing at Takeda, before we started really doing a lot of robust community outreach, it was really important to take a look at our operational aspects. Um, admittedly, and if we all take a, that step back and look at how clinical research is designed and the trial execution, some of those things actually limit populations. And so while we can do a lot of education around what clinical research is and start building that trust, it becomes increasingly important to take that pause and make sure we're really addressing some of those operational barriers that we have control over and can really adjust. Um, some of those include looking at inclusion exclusion criteria and, and taking a look back at trials that we performed um, trials in the same disease and looking at screen failure rates, seeing if there are any nuances there, um, really pressure testing even the contractual and study startup process to make sure we're asking sites about their patient demographics. Informed consent is one of those areas that I always think of. And then always also looking at um, financial aspects. Is there an opportunity to really use that feasibility and study startup process to proactively ask our sites how we can remove some of those barriers and then even taking it a step forward to um, ask questions that we may have not asked before uh, around patient diversity, around staff diversity, and how we can support to close that gap before we've ever reached the patient. So that by the time we're looking at trial participants, we've really taken a thoughtful approach of removing all of those barriers. And now when we go to the community, we have a trial that's actually more inclusive and it's conducive to enrollment that's diverse whether that would be you know, race, ethnicity, age, et cetera, but looking at it from that patient perspective. So that's really what our work has been centered on this last year is doing a lot of that operation work and now we're ready to pivot. And, and let me just ask, when you think about what an appropriately diverse trial should look like, where do you get that background demographic? How do you decide race, ethnicity, age, et cetera? 
Well, it starts with looking at the disease prevalency. Um, I think a great example, obviously, is with the COVID pandemic. I and mean, we were looking at um, over indexes in the over 75 population. We were looking at over indexes in people with comorbidities. We were looking at over index in people of color. And so in thinking about, quote unquote, a metric or a target or a goal, we wanted to make sure, uh, in my opinion, that we were reaching that. And so that's the approach that we're, we're taking is saying, okay, who is the patient population that it's impacting? Is it over indexed in certain populations? And really setting some sort of goal or metric at the trial level so that we're all marching to that same tune. And it really provides a conduit for how we should design our trials, starting from protocol development, even through that patient recruitment and retention plan. Really helpful, really helpful. And Javon, I, as we listen to Lachelle, we really hear sort of this um, push to, to make sure that trials have demographic diversity. In the rare disease population, that seems to be harder, I would think. And how are you thinking about this? So correct, Barbara, it's really challenging in rare diseases. Without having the goals of meeting the diversity and inclusion criteria, it is challenging to enroll rare diseases. But what we've established, very similar to what Lachelle described, what we've tried to do as a best practice is to institute way before the protocol development stage at the clinical development plan stage, where we're incorporating studies, the type of plans we want to pursue strategically, incorporating at that stage the thinking that will drive our programs forward, our individual studies. And it's become mandatory in the organization to try to incorporate that and have a very sound justification for pursuing the routes we described. If we choose to not go the route of um, um, being as diverse as possible, there needs to be a strong clinical justification for that. Is the disease not present or prevalent in that particular population or that gender, like in hemophilia. So there needs to be a clear rationale for that, but every effort needs to be put right at the outset to ensure that diversity and inclusion becomes a part of the protocols that support the development of those assets. And then we go into the details, right? The way Lachelle described as well, the inclusion exclusion criteria, all of those are methodically looked at to identify any opportunities that we can to ensure equity, to ensure diversity and inclusion. The prevalence and the epidemiology of the disease also influences a lot of what we do. And there's several sophisticated tools that we use to understand those diseases better and to work towards those targets. So we hold ourselves to targets. Oh, another thing we do is to kind of ensure transparency in how we're doing. We make it very public, all the data we've generated, um, all the efforts we're making towards meeting our diversity goals. It's one of the big imperatives of the organization. And if you think about um, publications, we also make a huge effort <laughs> in that regard to, to, to publicly share all these sorts of learnings that I've just described. So that's perfect. In fact, Pfizer was one of the first to publish its um, its uh, demographic across its entire therapeutic area portfolio. So congratulations, and I've seen others following suit. It's really wonderful. So tell me, how can academic institutions help you? So from my perspective, I mean, we're also talking a little bit about informed consent. And when I think about some of the mistrust that we see in communities, it's really rooted in not understanding or lack of transparency about what's actually being done. And furthermore, when we're out in the community, there's always a big question around what has been done to rectify that. So I think more education around the different parameters that are in place, IRBs, informed consent, and all of these different regulatory bodies that are really in place as almost a checks and balance is something that I, I, I know that the public does not necessarily think about or know. And so from my perspective, outside of just disease education and education about what is the process of a clinical trial, more education around those safeguards that are in place that have really come from um, a lot of the unethical aspects that we saw in the past. So we can talk about how we're moving forward and how it's changed for the better. 
That's great. That's great. I I, I agree. Most um, most people don't know what an IRB is. I mean, in fact, my kids probably graduated from college before they knew, and that's what I do. So, um, Javon, what's your thoughts about uh, how academic institutions can help? So I just want to echo what Lachelle said uh, around community outreach and education. It's really core to ensuring success in what we do. Um, the lack of trust, we've seen that among patient populations and establishing that trust, we've worked very hard to do that. But the, the credibility of the academic institutions, um, it's really something we rely heavily upon um, to gain that trust, right? To gain that trust in what we're doing as an IRB, we're safeguarding a patient's well-being, and we make every effort to do that. That transparency and echoing that same message um, as a united front, that's it's really critical to our success, I think. So I want to really focus on the informed consent problems for a while because, you know, as we've all seen and appreciated, the informed consents are just getting longer and longer, harder and harder to read, not health literate, not, you know, innovative in terms of how we present the data. Um, and at least the impression is that our, our ability to change that process, not the, not the interaction, but the process of the informed consent and what it looks like and how we deliver it, um, its length and complexity is something that's almost fixed, fixed by our institutions and fixed by um, liability concerns and other issues from our industry sponsors. Mm -hmm. So let me start with Javon in terms of how how should we address that together? Because I think it's just to say, I think it's an equal problem for the academics. We have all our boilerplate in there as well as all the other. So how, how do we get at that? So I'll acknowledge all of the challenges you described. Um, it's not challenges that's unique to the industry. Yeah. Um, we do face a lot of pushback from our legal colleagues, given that we're in a very, uh, in a society that's very lit lit litigious. Yeah. But we also face challenges across the globe with various requirements, mm -hmm. some more stringent than others with explicit detail being required in informed consent. And one of, one of the guiding principles um, I often think about is, what would I need to know or be able to communicate to a family member, my my mother, or anybody who doesn't have a medical background? What would I need to communicate to them and to ensure their understanding of what they're getting involved in? To, to, to get into explicit detail about study designs or legalistic language, it's really baffling. And I think it's really scary for a patient to be reading that. One of the, we've done several studies around this. One of the initiatives we partnered with academia on was putting together short form consents. So up to five pages. They've run trials on that at Duke University. We worked very well with them It's in the CTTI space. And then taking that easily readable five page document going through it in detail during the consent process and then taking maybe the more legalistic language in a longer book home as a reference. So you, you've you always got that as a fallback position, but that's, that, that's one of the tools we've used with success. Um, E-consent is another, is another tool that we've used. Um, successfully, there are certainly challenges in delivering the e-consent, but it's certainly an innovative way where we need more partnerships, we need more um, buy-in from in, uh, IRBs, from regulators on the adoption of e-consent and the more operational tactics to be to enable its success. So, uh, Barbara, does that answer your question? It's terrific. Lots to talk about, but let me give Lachelle a chance to annotate that. Yeah, I, I wish I had more to ask, but we're, we're so aligned. I mean, when I think about my wish list, it would be exactly that, is incorporating that short form of informed consent 
one of the steps that we took just this last year was to actually ask sites, when you're speaking with patients, what are those top areas that um, you hear questions about? Because oftentimes the informed consent includes so much language and so many topics that when you're actually in the room with the patient, their family or caregiver, they're not necessarily those questions that are top of mind. So how can we take that short form or that abrid abridged version and make sure that those top line questions that patients actually care about um, are included and really help to help that um, understanding, right? And increase that because we know that the more a patient understands what they're going to be actually undergoing in a clinical trial, it just helps with retention. And I know everyone always enrolls a patient with the intent of keeping them in a trial for the duration. And then furthermore, I'm right aligned. eConsent, I think, is a wonderful tool. It has the ability to have videos. It has infographics that I've seen. And one of my favorite um, features that usually some of the vendors have are those go-backs and checks, where they're literally providing um, keyword information and, and definitions. So it really allows for a more dynamic conversation between the study coordinator and PI as they're having um, the informed consent, but also ensuring that the patient truly does understand and what do we mean by the term placebo here, just as an example? And, you know, I agree. One of the challenges with rolling out e-consent is just the variation amongst um, institutions. Some can fully do informed consent. Some require it to be printed off. Um, some, you know, we're not able to use it because it's a completely different technology. So some standardization around that usage uh, is really what I would, would ask from an academic perspective so we can roll that out because it's only going to serve patient understanding of us. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And it also gives us the ability to embed, as you say, short videos, you know, what is an MRI? What is it so that people have a visual of what that's going to look like, and then what the side effects or what a rash should look like that you might want to report, those kinds of things, um, which we don't do now. We don't have the kind of common education that people are looking for. The um, uh, the not, FDA doesn't require it, but the common rule requires a key information section, which is very similar to the five pager that you are suggesting that every informed consent should start with a short key information section um, to, you know, for to explain those things that a participant, potential participant would want to know to make a decision as to whether or not to participate. Um, and scripting that well so that people look to that and understand that in a plain language way would be terrific if, if FDA adopted it as well. But you can, it's consistent with the FDA regulations. It does sound like that's what you're getting to. Um, but Javon, let me ask you one question. When you speak to your lawyers, do they insist that the participant sign the long form or just the short form? That's now the why, first question. <laughs> Barbara, now why did you go and have to bring the lawyers into this discussion? <laughs> well, because, this is a, this is a oh. challenge. It's a huge challenge we have, and those signatures are required. Um, yes, the lawyers do. It, it is a major challenge to kind of have it explained clearly that the FDA or the regulatory agencies do want to work with us on this and do want to simplify things. And it's very clear. We do have that challenge uh, in our organization, as I'm sure it is in other organizations as well. And we have the same in academics. You know, we have to, we have language we must introduce for subject injury so that there's no question that we're not paying for lifelong, you know, yeah treatment kind of thing. So yeah. Um, yeah. so we have to find a way of bringing our lawyers along. Uh, and that's not easy. <laughs> yeah, and I think um, a lot of, F so, sorry, Lord, Michelle, go ahead. Well, I said definitely not, um, but I, I think that really stems from, you know, lack of putting themselves in the patient's shoes to really say, okay, when I'm considering a clinical trial, what am I truly concerned about? And, you know, if we're honest, most are not concerned about the, the legal language that's at the end, but we have to have it. So 
we need to figure out a way to balance that, but humanize the experience a little bit. I have, I have found that that approach works um, to get through some of the things that we typically just hear no from, but it is going to be a little bit of a journey for sure. Yeah. Sorry, Javon, what were you going to say? No, Lachelle said it exactly. It is a huge journey for us, and uh, it just takes a lot of patience and explaining how we conduct clinical trials and what the regulatory environment as well, that to, to help them feel assured in the approach we want to take. And um, this, this varying approaches, I find that the more experienced clinical trialist lawyers do understand the situation and do want to work with us. Um, we often encounter very unique and challenging situations where we need to reach out to them and they're there to help us. Um, I find the seasoned um, lawyers really, really good to work with. Yeah. And I also think that the more we hold together as academic and industry and community health centers to say, this is not helping understanding, this is actually just, you know, sort of the, the long form, isn't isn't value add the better yeah. so i had this one idea I wonder what you think about it which is you know how you have a hospital consent you consent to be treated in the hospital but then when you go in and have surgery you have your surgical consent or blood transfusion consent what about having i consent to clinical research and here's all the stuff regardless of what trial you're in and then you have a dedicated research consent about this trial and what are the risks of this, of saying yes here, um, and sort of dividing it like we do for HIPAA now. You know, here's your access to information, here's your agreement to be in a clinical trial. Yeah, I'm, I've immediately thought of HIPAA and how that, you know, every time you go into the doctor's office, now it's shortened form so you can really understand what you're signing rather than the large packet that you used to get and i think it's it's a good call i think the only issue that i can possibly see is how to roll that out consistently because i'm sure you know as a sponsor i'd want my language included and that there and there and there lies the problem <laughs> i can see is everybody wanting so somehow we would have to pull some collective but i do like that idea because it in introduces the core components at the very beginning so that patients can really ask questions about what is the trial the drug what is it supposed to do and get into those more detailed discussions so we don't get bogged down in the legalese that you know don't support the trial so we need to find a way of collectively working on a model. Yeah. What were you going to say, Javon? Um, Barbara, I really like your idea. It's the first time I'm hearing an idea like that. It's quite disruptive. First time I've said it out loud to a public audience. <laughs> it, it's quite disruptive. And as with anything that's quite disruptive, it requires a lot of influencing. Um, but in its practical application, the advantages of doing that, I can, I can see a lot of advantages. And of course, there are disadvantages which, um, from a practical perspective, you and I may not place a lot of emphasis on, but there will be disadvantages that will be brought forward by our colleagues in legal. So how do we overcome those challenges together? I think that's probably the biggest thing we need to work together on. Yeah, yeah. Well, we look forward, and I can tell you Mass General Brigham is um, looking for the opportunity to work on that with strategic colleagues. Um, so we'll be reaching back out because I think that may not be the, the idea that we want to settle on, um, but certain things like finding um, digital solutions and uh, plain language. Um, the MRCT Center, which I run, has worked on a common clinical research glossary so that when you say randomization or, uh, you know, um, or placebo, it means the same thing to everybody and it can become sort of a nutrition label kind of idea. Um, so lots to do on that score. Let me, sorry, go ahead. I was going to just mention too, what I like about that idea is it starts moving the discussion around clinical research into a normal treatment paradigm. And while, you know, clinical research can't be um, 
discussed as a treatment option officially, it does start the thought process that clinical research is part of innovation of medicine and will kind of force that conversation to be moved upward yeah. um, from, with physicians. And I think that that is helpful overall in really helping educate around what that process is. Yeah, yeah. So w- one of the things that we've really thought hard about is the issue of um, English preference versus other languages um, and w- the challenge of waiting till you have uh, populations that speak another language to translate. Um, so, you know, 20 page informed consent form for English and a short form for someone in Spanish, you know, and then potentially they get a Spanish long form later, but certainly they're in the research at that time. Um, and, and one question is whether we should, even though there's no national language at, at, in, um, in the United States, should we be thinking about exactly as you say, the populations that will be engaged in the research or that we're trying to rec- recruit and make sure those consents are available from the get-go. And would that be an, uh, an incalculable expense or delay that would be problematic? Barbara, I don't, I don't think the, the expense or the delay factors into the discussion. I think it's the primary driver here is having the appropriate patient included and having the patient understand what they're getting involved in. So if that's our driver, it becomes sensible to follow through on that and to follow through early in our planning stage so that those costs or those timeline drivers are taken care of so it's not a rate limiter. To me, you know, it it has to, and then you've got to think about the process of informed consent as well, not just about a document. It's a discussion that takes place, right, with you, the primary caregiver, and any translator that you require to be there. So, so it's 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 a holistic process, and a patient needs to be given the time. So all of these factors need to incorpor- be incorporated into ensuring that the patient has um, all their rights respected. And translation, honestly, the cost and those pieces should be secondary to those guiding principles. Michelle, because then I'm going to counter that. Yeah, I mean, I have a lot of opinions about this because I've seen the implication real time. And um, quite frankly, it's usually because we're waiting until the patient is in front of us. And by then, it's almost too late. So for me, proactivity is key. Um, Even going so far as to look at the demographics of that population in that area and asking the site. I've even went that route because primarily uh, the question, the the response that I get is, yes, we'll translate into Spanish or does the site need it? Well, we need to start asking during that feasibility process or even earlier if possible. Um, We're even trying to find ways that we can log that information uh, based based on site experience so that we proactively know that. But even pressure testing and asking sites beyond just Spanish I've even, you know, asked that question, what other language, it forces that that other thought because oftentimes it's really, really just limited. And we know that we're a vastly multilingual, you know, um, country and we need to start thinking about that proactively. And then furthermore, part of the reason we need to ask that question earlier is it impacts other things outside of the consent. When I think of um, e-patient diaries, EPROs and all of those other cognitive assessments, it becomes, or excuse me, patient reported outcome and assessment that are included, there's a larger impact there. So even though we have the informed consent plan, what about all of those other patient outcome reports that we are that are not translated and now those patients are included, but they don't have the opportunity to participate in some of those other assessments that we really, really would provide um, a lot of just data around, you know, quality of life. So for that reason, we have to be a little more proactive around it. And um, I would even be an advocate for looking at the top languages in the area and proactively doing that. That would be my big wish list. So the, the, and just to say the Mass General Brigham has analyzed that. There are six primary languages. We translate all the 
hospital-wide, uh, system-wide information. Um, and uh, I couldn't agree more that having the outcome assessment pieces that are patient-facing also uh, available, validated, and sort of standardized in some way that if we could do that would be ideal. You know, a de depression scale should be available in multiple languages and not translated, but validated in someone's entrance, you know, preferred language. Um, so one, one of the interesting things, Javon, just to, to think about for a second is, in some institutions, and I'm not, uh, I don't know about uh, all of them, the cost of interpreters is levied on the investigator's budget. So there's a disincentive because, you know, we don't have an allowance for that essentially. And one of the things I think we should be doing is negotiating with sponsors who actually have deeper pockets than the investigator budget to say, if there is a translation ne necessary, we will pay for that um, in addition to the other costs. I don't think that, that, that the cost would be prohibitive. Um, and I think it would change people's attitude. You know, we're able to do that in clinical trials, and I think we should be able to do it in uh, I mean, in clinical care, we should be able to do it in clinical trials as well. Some people would say it's an institutional responsibility, but I know what's going to happen. You know, yeah. Yeah. But Barbara, I completely agree. And if you think about the proactive approach that Lachelle described, right, it's super critical to be thinking about those things early on and building it into the budget and negotiating it at the outset. Because to me, that is a legitimate expense that we do need to kind of account for if we want to progress and further this agenda of inclusion it, it has to be incorporated and again it varies a lot by institution as well so certain institutions may well bake it into their overall budget but some may not so that all the proactive planning that Lachelle described it's super important at the beginning that's that's exactly right yeah. And, and two, I look to, you know, other countries where multilingual is just part of the culture of that country. And we readily automatically assume that these particular countries need that language. So in the same vein that we're able to do that proactivity outside of the U.S., we need to start doing that here. And I think that can just only serve us well um, in the future. Now, I will say some of the feedback that I have gotten around um, going ahead and proactively translating things like um, the PROs is, well, what if we don't get that population? Is there is there significant value to that? But if all of us start doing that on an ongoing basis, that really provides that opportunity to have that aggregated data. I mean, traditionally, when we're looking at one disease state, we rely on the same assessments over and over, regardless of compound. So from that perspective, I mean, you can imagine the wealth of information that you can get with that post hoc analysis and the FDA, quite frankly, in their draft guidance, that's one of the, the areas that they're asking for. What is that post hoc analysis? So it would yeah. fit right into that plan. I mean, and, and it's actually an area that I think we could collaborate on in developing, you know, sort of the common scales uh, and and framework for asking some of those. And then you can add another five five questions, but you're not translating a new into X number of languages and validating a new all sorts of questions. And that seems to me something that industry could collaborate on. It's not institution in industry specific so it's not exactly it's not and it would serve all of us quite well to just have better data yeah yeah i uh, and I, i'll tell you we did a study um looking at all trials registered on clinicaltrials.gov um in 2019 and 2020 20 19 percent required english uh required people to speak read uh and understand English or be a native English speaker. Every time I hear you say that statistic, it, it shocks me that in 2020, we're still hearing, hearing that. 
but I bet it was really due to timelines. If I could, you know, be honest, when we're thinking about the trial design and we're thinking about some of the um, patient recruitment plans, somebody may have not thought about translating. And so the implication is that because they want to preclude any issues with translating um, interpreters, et cetera, et cetera. So not meant to be inclusive but or exclusive, but really just not taking that step back and planning from the very beginning and now adding that in so we can keep the trial going. Um, but I always beg the question, are we really are we really doing ourselves a, a favor with that? Because on the back end, we know a lot of trials struggle so much with enrollment. That extra time, we probably could have gotten that back by just translating and being a little more inclusive from a linguistic perspective. Yeah, and that and and coupling a commitment to health literacy and using language that people understand. Do you routinely have um, patient advocates or participants review your documents and your instructions and the PROs, et cetera? Or is that something that's done only internally? How does that work? I would say for PROs, for sure, um, internally, but for the patient recruitment materials, that is something that we're incorporating a little more readily. And I would even say more asking the patients almost to inform like that creative brief. What are the what are the areas that would really resonate with them and would make them want to participate in a trial? And then using that to inform the development of those documents. But I, I would say we probably need to do a better job of giving them the final product but again, timelines, we're always rushing, you know, to that development. And we do have that opportunity to do a little bit better with that. So, Barbara, from Pemphysis' perspective, we've instituted a multi-stakeholder input approach where our protocols, that's the first document that gets reviewed by patients, a key stakeholder means the patient is included. So we have ad boards we provided to the patient advocacy groups and we have extra airports where we discuss those protocols and the changes they'd like to see and incorporated thereby. I was talking earlier on about a clinical development plan. Yeah. That's included way at the start. So Interesting. if you're if you're gonna move a program forward, what's your plans to incorporate patient advocacy? So that's kind of any team that's progressing a compound has to be able to answer that and have a plan for it. So that plan is developed very early on. Well, and that's exactly what the recent FDA guidance has asked for. A, a, you know, while it's restricted in this one to race, ethnicity, diversity plans, it's really inclusive and invites inclusivity. Yeah. yeah. And Pfizer has, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, and it doesn't always have to be at the very beginning, that's the best, but I also think great learnings are learned as it's continuing because unfortunately we have protocol amendments and we have changes. So I always push back to teams saying it's not quite too late. You can always ask the patients and look for that opportunity when we have to amend, et cetera. It's always a great place to, to continue inserting that patient voice. Great point. So. Um, Pfizer has done really uh, innovative work on return of results to participants, both aggregate and uh, efforts at individual. Um, are you continuing that work? How important do you think that is for both the communities and the individuals? And then I'd like Lachelle to answer that as well. So, um... We're definitely continuing that work That's and, and improving upon the processes we've got existing. So it's found to be really helpful and even just thank yous to patients, right? Uh, acknowledging that they were part of something larger than themselves. It's, 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 a key, it's a key component of them appreciating what they've contributed to. So yes, it, we keep those processes in place and we improve upon them. Uh, look for every opportunity to. Yeah. And Michelle, are you able to do that at Takeda? I was going to say similar to similar to what we just mentioned. So we already have some of those transparency processes in place and just looking to expand those. And recently on our clinical trial on Takeda internal website, we made a very, very big update where now all of those clinical trial listings, including those that have results, um, are translated into over 30 languages. So we've really, really 30 plus languages actually. And there's a nice drop down where you can literally look at um, 
the upcoming trials, those that have recruited and those that are completed. And it was really along the veins of diversity, equity, and increasing that transparency, but making it available in a language that you can understand. So not only is it at um, a sixth to ninth grade literacy level with infographics, but it's also in that native language if you so choose. So continuing to build on those efforts, but that's definitely something that we're going to continue to roll out. And that was just one of those first phases or second phases, I should say. And that, that you find on the Takeda website with the- it is actually yeah, our clinical trial listing website, if you're searching for a trial. Mm -hmm. We tried to get uh, clinicaltrials.gov to have a plain language return of aggregate results for participants, but it's not in the legislation. But I, I'm like, well, so? <laughs> it's just another element, just add it. But it's terrific to hear all the work that you both are doing. And I'm sure you speak on behalf of the um, rest of the industry equally committed to making these uh, efforts and making them sustainable, real, and, um, you know, and hopefully we won't be having this conversation in five years because it'll just be so much the way we do our work that um, it, it, we won't need it anymore. But on, the, on behalf of the Mass General Brigham and, um, and myself, I wanna thank you both for contributing so wonderfully to this conversation and to our understanding of what you're doing to make this uh, different in the future than it is today. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Rochelle. Thank you, Rochelle. Thank you, Javon.